Hi, everyone, and welcome to part four of our webinar series, Legalese with the Ladies. My name is Sean Whalen. I am the co-founder and the CEO of Hopskip. For those of you who are not familiar with Hopskip, Hopskip is a tool for planners to source room blocks and meeting space at hotel properties. And since planners and hotels use our platform to facilitate the RFP and contracting process, we knew it was important to understand the impacts from COVID-19 from both the planner and the hotel perspective. In addition to providing educational webinars over the last six months, we've been working with today's presenters on some new features that are focused on helping the planner think about the right contract language to include in their RFPs. And we wanted to make sure that we shared those learnings to the rest of the meetings community. All right, so in far, as far as today's agenda, I firstly like to thank everybody that has, uh, excuse me, provided questions to Hopskip in advance of the webinar. The session will be focused on Barbara and Lisa providing their perspective to the questions that you've submitted. And that said, we do encourage you to please submit questions throughout the webinar at any point in the presentation using the Q&A button shown on the slide because those questions will help inform webinar topics for future webinars. All right. And before we begin, one of the main reasons why these webinars have received such positive feedback is from your input. It really does help shape the content that we present. And on the topic of feedback, we have two poll questions for you now that we'd love to get your input on. So I'm going to display them on the screen now and please provide your response. And then I'll kick it over to Barbara and Lisa to introduce themselves. All right. Give it a few more minutes here. Okay, we got some good engagement. Thank you all who are participating. Okay, great. I'm going to pass it over to Barbara and Lisa to introduce themselves. Jump in there, Barbara. Good day, good, good day everyone. Nice to be with you again. I'm Barbara Dunn with Barnes and Thornburg uh, based out of our Chicago office. Uh, fortunate to get to work with all types of groups in connection with their meetings, conventions, and trade shows. And obviously, um, since uh, earlier this year, uh, dealing in all manner of COVID-related issues as they impact uh, associations, their meetings, and events. And I'm fortunate to get to partner up again today with my good friend, Lisa Summer Devlin. Hi, everybody. I'm Lisa Summer Devlin. I'm based out of Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I have a solo practice there where I've been representing hotel companies, pretty much every major hotel company you can think of for close to 30 years at this point. And I'm very lucky that Barbara and I have been colleagues and friends for a number of years. And so we love doing these kinds of seminars together because uh, we get to talk five or 10 minutes before we start about the events of the day. So, so we enjoy being here and we thank you for having us, Hopskip. We thank you guys. All righty. I know the next slide we want to get out of the way. Quick legal disclaimer, Barbara and Lisa, do you want to explain this one to our audience? Well, yeah. you know, go ahead, Barbara, you go ahead. Yeah, I just, uh, just the caveat that you'll hear us say a lot today, uh, that it depends, uh, that the check with your legal eagle is all apropos because today's, our, our discussion today isn't legal advice. Definitely every situation is different. So you want to loop in your legal eagle when you can. And obviously in that regard, as you know, Lisa, talking to the lawyer before problems happen helps a lot. It's, it's a lot easier and cheaper for us to, to keep you out of trouble than to get you out of trouble. 
We absolutely agree with that. You know, this is this is not an advertisement for hiring lawyers, but what we are saying is that, again, as Barbara says, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So uh, we really recommend that if you see things uh, as a result of our presentation that make you concerned, that you contact with your lawyer as soon as possible because it's a lot easier to prevent than to fix, no question. Great, thank you, Barbara and Lisa. With that being said, let's jump into our first question. Okay, so question number one, how are you advising clients that are asking to cancel in 2021 when it's months away and so many things will continue to change? Barbara, Lisa? Yeah, I'll jump in on this first and then uh, have Lisa add in. So my guidance to clients in this scenario is to do a, a evaluation both internally and externally. So looking at your contracts, looking at your commitments, specifically, of course, force majeure provisions within those contracts, but also how many people are coming, how many rooms are blocked. If we're talking about a hotel contract, how much function space is blocked. That also is important to look at as well. Focus as well uh, externally on the facts and circumstances surrounding the area where you may be holding your meeting. Uh, you know, I realize that's a bit of a bouncing ball in that facts and circumstances are changing every day. Government restrictions are changing every day, perhaps every hour, but it is important to evaluate that. But at the end of the day, the organization really needs, needs to make the best interest, you know, take a, make a decision that's in the best interest of the organization. So often my discussion with the client is framed around the, the go or no go date. Because you know the timelines that you must you, you may have once lived by as to how much lead time you signed your contracts and worked with your vendors, all is out the window, of course. And that being said, is really evaluating your timelines and ideally making the decision based on the timeline that's in the best interest of your organization. Lisa? I agree with everything Barbara said, and but want to add that this is the classic it depends scenario. Uh, if, if somebody's coming to me and saying, we've got a meeting scheduled for 50 people, that's one answer. It's a different answer if it's a meeting scheduled for 3,000 people. You know, I had one of those yesterday. It was scheduled for, I think, January of next year. I think realistically, there's not going to be a place where you can bring together 3,000 people by January. So that would be one that you would have to let go. If it's 50 people, maybe you can. Um, the state of Florida went into their phase three within the last week or so, lifting all their restrictions. And so you can't say now what's going to happen. And I think Barbara's point to the go, no go date is very important. You have to look at when you realistically have to make a decision. But I think that that go, no, go, no go date is changing. I think it's getting much closer to the event dates because everybody's now learning that we have to be more flexible. Our vendors have to be more flexible. Everybody has to be willing to work together because if we're gonna rebuild the economy and rebuild the country, we've got to try and get meetings going again. <clears throat> we need to be able to say, let's be able to flex at the last minute. Um, we were talking before our uh, session today that I was participating in an event uh, this week that turned to a virtual event virtually last minute. I mean, they put together a panel of speakers in less than a month because they wanted to wait until the last minute to make their decision. I think that you're going to be seeing more than that, more of that as we move forward, depending on how the circumstances unfold. Well, awesome. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Lisa. We're gonna keep these questions and answers to a couple minutes just because we know we have a substantial amount of questions, but I think that was a, a good piece. So I appreciate both of those responses. The next question we have is, one of the largest struggles we as hoteliers are having is the clients that are continuing to exercise force majeure, when in our particular state, you can have 250 guests per room and there is nothing illegal nor impossible to host the event and we have had other very successful events. Well, I think Lisa. that's kind of one I should jump in on first yeah. since, since I represent the hotel side. Um, again, you have to remember that a force majeure situation has two elements, the unexpected event 
and that unexpected event has to make the event illegal, impossible, or whatever the standard is you've agreed upon in your clause. So if the state is open and would allow that meeting to go forward and the customer is deciding for their business reasons that they don't want to come, that's not a force majeure. That's an attrition or a cancellation issue. So um, again, every circumstance is different, but in general, that would be my answer. Yeah, and I would just respond that, you know, just because states might be lifting, lifting or loosening restrictions doesn't mean there aren't any additional requirements. Uh, those requirements often include social distancing and with large events also include filing plans with the state or local health department to get approval. So, you know, on the, the topic of impossibility, you know, make the point that you can't squeeze your size nine foot in a size five shoe, however cute it is. So if you've got a meeting of a thousand people, and even if there, you could meet as a thousand people, but there are requirements as to six foot social distancing, for example, you may not have the capacity at the facility that you need. And I think that's, Lisa, one of the main concerns a number of our clients have is exactly that. And so these, you know, I, I don't, I would tell you don't take the regulations on their face, do some research, but I would also tell you that they're changing every day. And there is a point in time, I think, as, as you well said, Lisa, where decisions do need to be made. And at that point in time, whether the restriction is in place, out of place, who the heck knows. Again, I think at the end of the day, trying to make a decision that's in the best interest of the group is what's important. And of course, as you indicated, look at the contract language. Awesome, thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, the next question we have. I didn't quite understand Lisa's explanation as to why only the hotel being indemnified would be in the group's best interest. It would be helpful to hear Barbara's insight on that point. Barbara, do you want to uh, lead this one off? I will, and I'd certainly let Lisa speak to, to the context because she always explains it well to me. <laughs> So uh, I think the intention here is there's a concern that if we have mutual cancel, pardon me, mutual indemnification, that those those provisions will cancel each other out and therefore there would be no coverage. And I don't necessarily disagree with Lisa's position, although it's all based on the facts and circumstances of what happened, right? So there may be circumstances in which the hotel alone acts negligently and that causes someone to get injured and the group to get sued and vice versa. There may be circumstances when it's the group acting negligently, but in a lot of tech cases, there's shared negligence, right? There's, there's, you know, I saw the cord not taped down, the hotel person might have seen it too, and someone fell. So I think that's where you were coming from, Lisa, not to take, steal your thunder on that, but from, you know, the group's perspective, I think indemnification is an important risk management tool, and I definitely recommend it in all contracts, but you know, the, the risk, as you indicated, uh, or the concern that you indicated, uh, certainly I think that's the context I hope that you were drawing from. If I'm wrong, tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what I was trying to say last time is, um, in the distant stands of time before I became a hotel attorney, I was a personal injury defense attorney. So I defended the kinds of cases that happen when events occur, you know, trip and falls, whatever it is. Usually when something like that happens, as Barbara points out, the injured party sues everybody they can think of because there's more pockets to pick from essentially. 99.9% .9 of all cases that are filed ultimately settle without a determination of who's at fault. And I'm not exaggerating that percentage, that's really true. And so when you have these mutual indemnification clauses and both parties have been sued, the hotel goes to the group and says, indemnify me, I've been sued. The hotel goes to, I'm sorry, the group goes to the hotel and says, indemnify me, I've been sued. The clauses cancel each other out. And so neither party ends up getting identified, indemnified and they settle. So that's why I'm saying mutual indemnification really doesn't help either side. And I'll just add to that, I think that, you know, th this is a clause where, again, every word makes a difference. So this is something if you're going to go out in your contracts with it or reviewing it, uh, if you're being asked to indemnify a party is again, make sure the legal eagle takes a look at it because it can have a huge impact. Excellent. Thank you. All righty. I'm sure you'll say it depends on the contract, but is there anything we can do with the venue to let us make a go or no go decision a little farther in advance. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on this from the group's perspective. Uh, certainly there's an ability to negotiate a business resolution. 
think oftentimes uh, uh, the hotel or convention center facility needs to understand uh, what's happening at this meeting and why it may be important for the group to make a decision on the meeting sooner than later. And that often doesn't get communicated and there's a generality, for example, that no, it's, it's too far out or it's, you know, that type of thing, you've got to wait longer. So I think negotiating a business resolution is a good idea. Also, hotels have been very flexible and I thank them on behalf of my clients for extending hotel cancellation fees, the, the various sliding scale tiers to take a tier that, for example, might expire on October 31st, 2020 and agree to extend that to January 31st, 2021 in an interest to allow the group to make a business decision because, of course, everyone wants the meetings to go forward and I, I i sometimes get on my soapbox a little bit about this because i often say the groups don't want to cancel their meetings i mean you all uh the, the group side listening these are often revenue producing meetings or their company meetings that are essential to your company so no one wants this but we're all trying to make the de best decision when we can as soon as we can and again i think being open with the hotel as to where your concerns lie and what the meeting is about, I think it's helpful. Lisa? I couldn't agree more. Uh, you know, we hear all the time, it takes us nine months to, to make this event a go. That doesn't really tell your hotel partner anything. You need to have a list that you can come to them and say, I need to do this by this date. I need to do that by Y date and, and be able to explain why it can't be pushed back. If you give a hotel a good factual basis for why you need to make a decision by X date, they're going to be more willing to work with you than if you just say, well, we have to, we have to make a decision six months in advance. Because as I said, I think it's a changing world. I think it's going to continue to change. And things that we used to do farther in advance are going to be compressed because everybody's going to have to be nimble and ready to make decisions and changes on a short-term basis. Great. Thank you. All righty. Next slide. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next question. With the risk of hotels going out of business, I've been requesting hotels add that they will keep the client's money in escrow to help my client avoid loss of those funds. The hotels are refusing to add it to the contracts. And how would the process work of ensuring they did put it in escrow? Or would that not be of concern if the contract at least stated that it would be? Maybe I should jump in since I'm on the hotel side. The term escrow is, is not really well understood. The point of escrow is, is that a third party is holding the funds and the third party then disperses them according to what, what the circumstances turn out to be. The reason that hotels don't say automatically is we're going to ask your, escrow your deposit is that usually they use those deposits while they're waiting for your event to happen. That's their cash flow. That's why they operate the way that they do. So they don't want to not have access to those funds. Your concerns, of course, are legitimate in, in light of what's going on here. But if you just ask for an escrow and do nothing more, <coughs> excuse me, nothing's going to happen. You have to find a third party escrow company. You have to agree on an escrow agreement as to how those funds are going to be held, who's going to get interest if there is any, how they're going to be paid out, all the whole raft of things that you have to agree to. And of course, there's a cost involved. So if you're the customer and you want this escrow, it's reasonable for the customer to have to bear the cost of that escrow agreement because the hotel otherwise would not be doing it. So that's why you're, you're getting pushback because it's not just as simple as saying, hold it in escrow. Barbara? Yeah, no, I, I agree with Lisa with your concerns and I know that escrow arrangements are, are not popular among hotels for all the reasons that you mentioned. I think there's a practical solution here. And that is look at the deposit schedule, look at the payment schedule. You know, if you're negotiating a contract, that's something that can be negotiated. And while I realize that cash might need to come in on a, a regular basis leading up to the meeting, I think that the cash flow can, can be negotiated, deposits can be negotiated so that they're not front loaded uh, toward a meeting that might not happen for two more years. So I think from a practical standpoint, uh, definitely look at negotiating those. Again, I think hotels have been flexible with that. And again, I think that's one practical way to manage the risk going forward. Uh, also, as Lisa indicated, if the hotel does go out of business, 
bankruptcy rules apply to overall. So at that point, you know, yes, you'll line up with all the other creditors. Uh, and so from that standpoint, there's really nothing you can do. And again, the escrow piece, absent that, certainly um, you're not going to get that. Again, I think the next best thing to do is really to just manage it from a practical standpoint. Great. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Lisa. I know that has been the escrow topic has been a pretty hot topic over the past few weeks. So I'm glad that you were able to provide some context on that. Okay, the next question is, what is a good example of a contract clause to cover hotel cancellation? Well, let me start out by reminding you again, we're not going to give you legal advice, which would include giving you sample clauses. Um, I will tell you at the outset that even if there's no clause regarding what happens if the hotel cancels, that hotel still owes you money. They're breaching their contract and they owe you money. And under the law, they would have to pay you for the additional expenses you incur that you would not have incurred otherwise unless you had had to move your event to a new location. So that would be increase the cost of finding a new location if the food and beverage at the new place for the same kind of food is more expensive, that would be covered. Cost of reprinting your materials, things of that nature. So you can have a clause that addresses that the hotel will be responsible to pay for those kinds of things. But even if you don't have a clause, that's the law and the hotel would have to pay you. And Barbara yeah. will add to that. Absolutely. Barbara wants to sweeten it. Yeah, I agree. I agree with Lisa. Certainly every example that she gave is, is a direct, uh, falls in the category of direct damages. So if there's a breach of contract, those are all the damages that flow from that breach. So all the all the costs to shop for a new facility and all the various differential costs that happen. When, what you can do within the clauses as well, assuming you can negotiate that, is there are other categories, other types of damages, including indirect and consequential damages. That's often the next level fallout, if you will. So for example, if you're an association and as a result of having to not find a new facility for a meeting, if the hotel were to cancel on the group, you might lose your big sponsor of the meeting. So that's an example of indirect or consequential damages. Typically, you don't get those kinds of damages unless you put them in the contract. So there's an opportunity there. Attorney's fees is another one. Some states allow for recovery of attorney's fees. Some states don't. But certainly, you'll need an attorney to help guide the cancellation process and the negotiating a new contract process. So it would be an expense as well. So for me, those are the really main points. And the last comment I would say is, you know, there's often a desire to cap or limit damages in those circumstances. So if the hotel were to cancel on the group and sometimes that cap or limit is tied to the cancellation by group clause, the sliding scale. And I, Lisa and I both agree that that's never, not a good idea because all the factors that make up that set of numbers for group cancellations mean nothing for hotel cancellations. So that's something problematic that I see, Lisa, and I, I know you agree with that point. Yeah, let's be crystal clear on that. Barbara and I both agree that mutual cancellation clauses where each party owes the same amount if the other one cancels are, are not a good idea, not appropriate. So we don't recommend that. All right. Next question. Sometimes hotels try to remove the following verbiage. Should we accept the deletion? For example, early departure fees, no-show fees, and individual cancellation fees charged by the hotel where collected will count toward the room block commitment. Barbara, do you want to kick that one off? Yeah, this is ultimately, this is a business issue. It's something that uh, is frequently negotiated. Actually, when I saw this question, I was a little surprised because normally uh, I don't see this clause getting a lot of pushback, particularly because um, it references to fees that were charged by the hotel and collected. Because I know a lot of the hoteliers listening today say, well, that's all well and good if I try to charge someone one night room a tax, but if they challenge it with their credit card company, I'm not getting the money. But the fact of the matter is, again, the hotel wouldn't be earning these fees, but for uh, someone canceling. And for a lot of groups, uh, if individuals wash the block or cause the block, if you will, to reduce or have attrition, uh, these getting these fees credited toward attrition can be helpful. So I think that's something that's worth always pursuing at the end of the day, though. It's a business decision. Again, if you're a corporate meeting and everybody's under a master count, this isn't important. But if you're if you're an association meeting or pe people choose to come, then I think that this clause becomes important. Lisa? 
I agree with everything Barbara said. It's a business decision, something to negotiate. Uh, hotels don't like to do this because, again, of revenue issues and all those kinds of things. And as Barbara points out, sometimes collecting those fees can be problematical and it can be an accounting nightmare to figure out which fees were charged and which were actually collected. But it's a business decision at the end of the day. All righty. In the second webinar, there was a discussion about bad contract clauses for adjusting attrition moving forward. Are there any other bad clauses that you have seen added to contracts that we should avoid for events after the pandemic? Barbara or Lisa, if you want to add something on that. I think that it's not so much um, a particular type of clause that's bad, it's that a clause is poorly worded or doesn't address the issue that you're trying to address appropriately. I mean, there are certainly clauses that I see like uh, pest control clauses that that are you know generally terrible. And I see clauses about cancellation for political reasons that I think are generally terrible, but that's because I represent the hotel side. But when I talk about bad clauses, I usually mean poorly drafted clauses. Yep. Yep. No, I, I definitely agree with that as well, Lisa. Um, I think it isn't so much the clause itself is bad, but it's the drafting. And, and one comment in that regard is when I see clauses that are drafted very specifically. So, for example, a clause that would specifically address COVID-19. Well, that in and of itself might be beneficial to the group and or the hotel. Sometimes the clauses are too narrow. You know, we lose the sight that there may be other things that might impact your ability to perform that contract. Also kind of trying to bake in local safety health regulations. Those are things which the, the hotel would have to comply with regardless of whether the contract says it says that or not. So at the end of the day, I think that's really where I have a challenge. And then as groups make amendments, remember not addendum, to the contracts uh, to maybe change the dates or reduce the block, whatever the case may be, you know, bad clauses or the bad circumstance, if you will, comes in when uh, there's not that syncing up between the original contract and the addendum or the amendment, <laughs> as it should be called. And that's a problem, Lisa, and you, know, you and I talk about that a lot, is that the tracking and the wording is inconsistent, and so it does lead to a dispute later on. And this is especially important given the fact that you might have another you need to rebook another meeting, this being the second meeting, let's say. So it's something that I think definitely groups should focus on, but I agree with you on the, the, the generally on the bad clause issue. Great. All right, I hope everyone is finding the Q&A so far informative. We wanted to let everybody know that in addition to providing education through these webinars, HopSkip has partnered with Barbara and Lisa to implement a lot of this information into our platform as well. So if you have any interest in learning more about how HopSkip can help drive confidence in your sourcing process, please let us know by clicking yes, which will be shown on your screen here shortly. All right. We'll just let that run for a few seconds here. And then we will jump back into the remainder of the Q&A. Okay. All righty. Next question. Thank you all who just engaged in that poll as well. How can we ensure that vendors are taking the appropriate safety measures, same for exhibitors, and who is actually responsible at the end of the day? Barbara, Barbara you go first. Yeah, there we go. I'll go for it. Okay. <laughs> uh, I will say that, you know, how to ensure vendors are taking the pro appropriate measures is to ask. Ask the vendor what they're doing. Ask what they're doing, feel comfortable with what it is that they are doing, and then bake it into a contract with that vendor. Make sure that that aspect, we understand what the rules of the road are. I think that's, that's first and foremost. In addition to that, you could certainly try to add an indemnification provision one-way street in the vendor contract. I think that's another opportunity there. 
and even potentially ask that vendor not only to confirm that they have insurance coverage, but also to name the group as an additional insured under that insurance coverage. So I think there are, again, practical things that could be done, things you could do in the contract, and again, things you could do outside the contract, such as insurance to manage the risk. But at the end of the day, the question, who's responsible? Everybody, potentially, depending on the circumstance. Uh, as as you, many of you have often heard me say that plaintiff's lawyers need to send their kids to college too. <laughs> so, you know, we'll, we're already seeing lawsuits erupt from cruise travel. And I likely think we'll see them erupt with other, you know, types of meetings and events. So even at the same time, maybe at the state and federal levels, there's um, a desire to implement limitations of liability uh, for facilities, venues, and others, uh, those efforts are still underway. So I think at the end of the day, you know, we have to look for the fact, Lisa, as is the case when you were defending uh, uh, these claims that um, we're going to get hit in all directions and, you know, everyone's going to be pointing the finger and, and looking at all the, the contracts and insurance aspects of, of any of these claims. I, I agree with Barbara, and I, I think the key word in this question is appropriate. What does appropriate mean? Who decides what's appropriate? Who sets that standard? Uh, as Barbara and I both said, everybody has the obligation to comply with all applicable laws, uh, but I'm seeing clauses where people are saying you will do X, Y, and Z. Well, hotels are going to push back on that because the hotels have their own protocols and everybody should have protocols. So I agree with Barbara. You should ask your vendors, what are your protocols so that at least you know that they're doing something, but I don't think that you should take upon yourself the obligation to tell other parties what is appropriate and not appropriate. Because if you do that and you do that wrong, you could be liable. Uh, I, I agree with Barbara that there's litigation about um, uh, cruise ships and very contained events where there's an outbreak, but I think it's going to be very hard for anybody who gets on a plane and travels to another city and spends four days there interacting with all kinds of people in all kinds of um, places to prove where they got COVID-19. So I think that the key here, as Barbara alluded to, is really good liability insurance. That liability insurance is going to pay for uh, the defense of these claims, pay for settlements and judgments, and you need to be talking to your insurance broker about will COVID-19 claims be covered or not covered because many policies are going to exclude those or there may be new kinds of coverage that you're gonna have to buy. So those would be my points on that. Very good points. Thank you, Lisa. All right, next question. What is, and I know this topic has been touched upon in our previous webinars, and I know this is still something of curiosity amongst planners, so Barbara, maybe you can kind of kick this off. And the question is, what is the best way to approach review dates with our partners? I think the best way to approach the review date with partners is really uh, getting your act together internally first. And that goes back to all the moving parts and staff and other components of your meeting and making sure the team has really looked carefully at your normal timeline and look to make adjustments given the unnormal or unusual circumstances that we live in today and make adjustments. And so I, out of the gate, I think that needs to be tightened up before then you have a conversation with your partners. And again, as we mentioned earlier, having the ability to communicate uh, that we've made modifications, we'll, we'll try to hold out as long as we can, but at the end of the day, this is what we believe the go, no go date would be. But approaching it in a way that first of all, it's hat in hand. None of us want to be in this situation. Both parties are suffering. So the, the um, you have to, um, has to, to me go out the window. I just don't think that's a good way to approach the discussion. I certainly think to the extent you can be open to extending timelines. Again, we talked earlier about extending cancellation, cancellation fee parameters, and I think that's a good strategy as well. But I think being transparent in that regard, and you know, one other thing, I mean, it's also hard to convey bad news, right? So there may be circumstances in which you say, you know, this is our date and we, we really can't change it. And when you're asked what's your next open year, it may be 2031. And that just may be the way that it is. And whether you, it's good news you're communicating or not, 
communication to me is the most important thing because of course we all know that if the hotel or other partner hears it on the other side, not from you, that often even takes much more time to unwind than if you had took the, the proverbial bull by the horns and, and addressed the conversation first. Lisa? I agree with everything she said. Again, the, the operative word here is partner. Don't view it as an adversarial relationship. I agree with Barbara. Go to your partner and say, here's our concerns. Here's why we have these concerns and here's how the dates will impact those concerns. What can you give us? Um, what, what are you willing to do? Again, your hotel partner wants to have business. So they're going to work with you to have that business if there's a way to figure out how to do it. Uh, and we all should be trying to do that to spur our economy. So I'm seeing situations where partners are coming, or, you know, customers are coming now in, I can't believe it's October. They're coming in October and saying, you know, what are you going to be able to do in June? To which our answer is, I don't know, nobody knows. So, you know, that's not helping. Setting a deadline now of what can happen in June isn't, isn't going to help anybody. So instead say, let's, let's get together once a month and talk about where we are and see how that impacts where we are and what we think we can do. And then let's talk about what's our go, no go date, which we keep talking about and have that regular conversation rather than drawing hard lines in the sand. I, I would agree on all those points. Thank you both. <laughs> and I know we actually went over this in our webinar three as well. So I'm glad that we're able to expand on it a little bit. How do we postpone an event twice? Well, it's, it's happened a lot. Uh, you know, when this first started in the spring, everybody was saying, okay, we're going to push our meeting back to October. And now here we are in October and in many jurisdictions, it can't happen. <clears throat> and you can do an amendment again, and, and Barbara mentioned 2031. I just did one of those yesterday. I'm like, you're kidding me. Your next open date is 2031. Uh, you can do that, but I think Barbara and I agree that when, when you're getting to postponing twice, um, it's probably better to just start over and have a new contract and have an agreement that says, okay, the original event is gone. We are now rebooking it for whatever year it is, and here's a new contract term, because as we always talk about, every time you amend your contract, you have to look at everything that's impacted, your dates, your rates, your attrition, your cancellation, your concessions. How does any of that change or not change? But you have to look at it. And so I think once you're going into the twice of, of pushing it forward, I think it's better to start over. What do you think, Barbara? Absolutely, I agree. I mean, uh, you don't want to have a patchwork quilt. You don't want to have inconsistency between the documents and because dates are obviously so material to the contract they're 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 hitting a lot of places in the contract so i think at that point it makes sense to to do a new contract having said that i will say that this process if you've had to or, or going to have to postpone your event twice this does expose weaknesses in maybe when you postpone your contract the first time because often I'd have a group say, oh yeah, that was okay. You know, cancellation fees were waived in consideration. I said, now where did they write that down? Is it in that memo? Because again, that exposes the weakness. So, you know, when you get to that second opportunity, there is an opportunity to start fresh. And this is, a, this is certainly the, the guidance that we'd like to have would be the one clean contract. But don't forget those other steps, those other postponements, uh, those definitely you want to be uh, sure on what circumstances or on what conditions um, those were changed in the first place, Lisa, because again, I've seen I've seen that come back and say, no, 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 wait a minute, you were supposed to pay cancellation fees from the first event, and we'll transfer to the second event, and then now you're you know, going to be 10 years out. So again, I just think it, it can expose weaknesses, which is why, obviously, um, it is important at every step in this process to make sure that what you're writing up is, is the appropriate thing, whether it be an amendment or a new contract. Right, and then just to, to go forward on that, you know, I've, I've had the circumstances where customers are saying, well, we want exactly the same terms for 2031 that we would have had for 2020. And at some points the hotels are saying, you know, 10 years from now, our rates are not gonna be the same. Uh, and so, you know, you really need to evaluate all those kinds of things. Great point. All right. How to create a clause if the hotel is having competing groups with different self-enforced COVID protocols? Barbara, do you want to start with this one? 
Yeah, I just, I, 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 it's a very interesting question and I understand um, what's led to that question. I think it's gonna be difficult to, to write a clause in a contract that could really capture this. Again, I, I like to think that, you know, certainly you could, there are things you can address in a contract, but there are also things that you can and should address outside the contract. And so in business discussions with the hotel, especially if you're leading into a meeting that's coming up, what other groups might be in house if the hotel is able to tell you that? And what would the hotel's policy be if, and again, if this is a local requirement that a group, in, another group inside their space is not following, that's one circumstance. If it's a voluntary um, requirement and that particular group doesn't want to live by that, then that's something that the group should know ahead of time because, again, there may be practical things that they can do to minimize the impact. But short of that, I don't see that, you know, baking something into the contract about that hotel has likely have a separate contract with that group. And then if they're kicking them out or canceling on that group, that's exposing the hotel to liability too. But of course the hotel has an interest in making sure everyone would play by the rules or play by the guidelines or best practices because no one wants their staff employees to be impacted by this terrible disease. So I think that there's a shared interest, but I think it's a conversation topic, not necessarily a contract clause. Lisa? I agree. Um, I think Barbara covered it well. And this might be the kind of thing that you cover in your pre-con meetings, and maybe you're going to want to have pre-con meetings sooner rather than closer in time to the event so you can address those kinds of issues. Uh, but I don't think it's something that you can really cover in a clause because there's so many moving parts here. Fair. Great. All right, next question. What is the difference between termination and cancellation? Does a contract need to include both? A cancellation means that you decide for business reasons that you're not going to go forward with the contract. So the group decides to go somewhere else or they decide they're not gonna have the meeting at all, it's their business decision. Or the hotel decides they're gonna cancel the group because they've got a better opportunity. If you cancel a contract, the non-breaching party, the non-canceling party is entitled to damages. A termination means that the contract is treated as if it never happened. So that's a typical force majeure situation. There's some other circumstances where people agree that if something happens, they can terminate the contract. So in other words, everybody just goes their separate ways in a termination. That usually, and you don't have to have this in your clause because it, it includes under the law um, that all deposits are, re are refunded. Although from the hotel perspective and a termination, uh, they may want to have a provision in there that says if it's a last minute termination, say a last minute force majeure situation, we had a lot of these in the spring where the group literally canceled on the day of arrival and the hotel had already ordered all the food and was stuck with that. So some termination clauses will say that um, the expenses incurred to, to the date of termination will be recoverable, but otherwise the parties go their separate way. So that's the difference. Barbara, what I leave out? No, n nothing. I mean, it's, it's a perfect definition of each of those terms and how they should be properly used. But we know that the terms are often not properly used in that context. So at the end of the day, um, while I definitely think it's important to appropriately characterize cancellation termination, it really matters on what the clause says. So, you know, you could call it Fred, and if it still it calls for a, a right to cancel or terminate without liability, you know, that's what's really important to me, which leads to one of my pet peeves, which is inconsistent terms throughout contract, because Lisa, um, I often get the question, what's the difference between a contract and an agreement? Uh, and again, I go back and say, you know, it's, it's not what it's called, it's what it says. And that's really the, the key important component to it. So I think there's good focus on that, but being consistent, I think is a good strategy, of course, on both sides of the aisle. Great. Okay. When our organization returns to face-to-face -to -face events in 2020, it will be hybrid. How do we make sure that within our hotel contract, we are protected with AV needs, either using in-house or third-party AV? So I'll just jump in on this one. Uh, there are many hotels that have exclusive arrangements with audiovisual or AV companies in the contract, which may require the group to use that AV company. But the question is always one fair to ask, is this required to use the in-house provider or can we use our own provider? 
So that question should always be discussed in advance, obviously during the contract negotiation process. If there's ability to be flexible and the hotel is willing to do so, then I think putting in the, the right of the group to, to utilize its own supplier is important. Of course, the hotel may ask to make sure that supplier has insurance and will indemnify the hotel. Again, those are reasonable requests. A lot of times though, some of the AV and other work at the hotel is tied to union labor, is tied to labor jurisdiction. So there may be some aspects of that that you couldn't use your own vendor. Having said all of that, if you are to use a vendor and you're going to have to pivot in a way that either increases or decreases the amount of services and equipment that you'll need from the AV provider, that should be addressed in the contract because we want to have an ability that to make modifications. And usually there's still a separate agreement with the provider. You'd want the ability on the group side to make modifications to what you need and not have it impact uh, pricing, ideally, uh, and not have it charged a fee for that reduction or ultimately, you know, what I hear a lot, Lisa, for a lot of my clients is some of the in-house providers don't have the capability of we are to do the, the streaming that the group needs. And I think that should also be addressed up front. And again, a little bit of flexibility on the part of the hotel. But I think it's reasonable, as you understand, I think as well, Lisa, for the hotels to say, if you're bringing in someone who's not our other, otherwise a contractor at our hotel, you need to make sure that they have the appropriate insurance and, and agree to indemnify the hotel. I agree with everything Barbara said. Um, I think this is one of those situations that needs to be addressed in your RFP process. So if there are factors like this that are really critical to you, uh, you need to get that out in front of the hotel right away saying we need to be flexible on AV um, and you need to find out if there are those union agreements in place that would impact your ability to do that. And again, that, that's that that's just a fact. You just need to know whether or not the hotel is is constrained by that or not. Uh, that may go to your site selection, ultimately in deciding whether or not you need to do this. In most of the contracts that I deal with, I, I can't think off the top of my head, any hotel contract that had a minimum AV spend included in it. Um, so usually it's ultimately up to the customer to decide what they wanna use and how they wanna use it. But Barbara's correct, many hotels, virtually all of them are going to have requirements about bringing in third parties, whether or not they prohibit it, which they are allowed to do, um, or even if they don't prohibit it, they're going to ask for insurance and indemnification. And so you need to be prepared to do that and you need to budget for that if that becomes appropriate. Awesome. Thanks, Lisa. And I'm glad that you mentioned, I know that's something that you've, both of you have mentioned in our previous webinars, the importance of communicating those kind of details up front and making sure that you're having that conversation during the RFP process with your hotel partner. All right, next question is, how has attrition changed post COVID? Um, it's, it's the classic, it depends. Right. Uh, it depends on if you're talking about attrition in first quarter of 21, exactly. or if you're talking about attrition in 2022. Certainly hotels are going to be more flexible, are being more flexible during 21. And I, and I know I've said it 14 times and I'll say it again, hotels would rather have some business than no business. And so they're going to be flexible with you in the short term. They're not gonna be flexible with you forever because um, hotels need to have real business. They need to have a commitment that they can go to their owners and their shareholders and say, we've got a contract on the books that's worth $200,000. And if they agree you, um, uh, if they agree that you can have unlimited attrition, that contract isn't really worth $200,000. So again, it depends on the meeting. It depends on the location. It depends on the nature of the situation. Um, but asking for flexibility is, is something that I think is reasonable at this time. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, the flexibility is, is what's critical on the going forward. And, you know, if you're working with a hotel that isn't, doesn't want to be flexible, then you know, it almost forces the group's hand to take an action that it wouldn't otherwise want to. So I, I haven't seen any circumstance in which that had been the case. However, I will say on new contracts for new bookings, um, there may be flexibility on attrition, there might not be. And if there's not, and you need it as a group, remember you can always negotiate with your feet and look for another property because I know there'll be plenty out there that would still want your business. One other item to add here, and that is that uh, there are, you know, promotions out there, there are no, no attrition fees, right? 
come use the rooms, you know, no attrition fees. It is critical that you include language in the contract to that point, because not having that attrition language in there means that group could be responsible for 100% of lock. So it's really important, just the absence of the clause doesn't mean it's taking it away. In fact, arguably it's making it worse because you don't have that. And Lisa, I know that's something that we agree on as well. And, and uh, there's some cases dating back quite a while now that, that substantiate that position. Absolutely, so let's summarize that. If your contract says nothing about attrition, that means you owe for 100% of the block. So if you are entering into a deal where you are expecting that you will not owe if you don't fill your block, you need to have a clause that expressly says that, which most hotels aren't gonna to wanna to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you both. Resort fees and cleaning fees. If certain amenities aren't currently available, are hotels flexible on this? What are hotels offering in return? Lisa, do you want to kick this one off? Well, yeah, if, if at the time you contracted for a hotel, they had certain amenities and they no longer can have them because of restrictions due to COVID, that's a discussion you should have and see what they're willing to do for you. Um, I often see contract clauses that, that want the hotel to guarantee that existing amenities will all be there and won't change. That's something I usually take out because obviously a hotel could have restaurant A today and decide they either don't want to have it or they're going to have restaurant B tomorrow. But if it's something that were critical, was critical to you choosing that property and it's no longer there, then certainly there should be a discussion because you're not getting the value for what you're paying for the, for the contract. So that's that's a discussion. Yeah, I agree, I agree with Lisa. And sometimes it's uh, the challenge is that it's not defined in the contract, what's included in the resort fee. And that should be included so that you understand that to Lisa's point, it may be within or without the hotel's control, control as to whether they can offer that good or service, you know, spa access or fitness centers, for example, that might be restricted. But at the end of the day, knowing what's included is important. And I would say that no matter what circumstance that we're talking about this topic in, certainly um, since resort fees and other charges sort of have come online, uh, uh, you know, in many, many years ago in recent past, you know, the question is always, what, am I, what are we getting in return? So I think defining that is always important. And in particular, I think defining it in a way that doesn't allow for the rug to get pulled out from under you, meaning that you, you said something was included at the time of contract and now it's in, not included now. So putting a check, if you will, on modify, modifying what's included in the resort fees is a good strategy. Although it's always great, Lisa, if they add things to the <laughs> resort <laughs> fee, right? It is. As opposed uh, and, and just, to, just you know, I need my morning coffee. So. <laughs> um, and Barbara always brings me my morning Diet Pepsi when we're together. So, <laughs> um, so and just to put a finer point on that, anything that you discuss leading up to the contract is great, but if it's not written in the contract, it's not there. So if they promised you all these amenities during the discussions and they're not in the contract, you're not necessarily entitled to them. So if something's really critical to you that the spa be available, that should be something that should be included in your contract. Perfect, thank you both. Event insurance, I know another buzzword or hot topic in the industry over the past few months. How does this impact, if at all, force majeure? How should our insurance clause read and what kind of insurance should third party event agencies have? I'll jump in on this one. So, you know, I often get the question, if I have good language and force majeure in my contracts, I don't need insurance, right? And my response is, they cover two different lines. Uh, the language in your contracts would cover the expense side, that is maybe not having to pay cancellation fees if you're forced to cancel your meeting. But it doesn't cover the revenue side. It doesn't make up for the revenue that you've lost in not having the meeting. That's where event cancellation insurance can come in. So those of you who are, have claims or pursuing claims coming out of COVID, certainly been working with the claims folks, um, we're seeing good progress made on our end, so for those that have it. Of course, if you got your policy in late January of this year, it's likely going to have a specific COVID exclusion. And so then I, the, the next frequently asked question I get is, well, is it even worth it to get event cancellation insurance? I said, if this asset, this meeting makes money for you, and you could get insurance for that asset, 
I would get a quote. I would find out because I've been doing this now for over 28 years and I've taken group food claims on things that are already and will continue to be covered under event cancellation insurance. That includes hurricanes, um, government shutdowns, uh, unavailability of a principal facility, um, unavailability of a principal speaker, there's just a whole host of things. Now, I'm not selling insurance. I'm asking the groups or telling my clients to make a business judgment, the cost versus the benefit, right? And that's on the revenue side. You know, having the same approach on the contract side is always a good strategy, regardless of whether you have insurance. And as we talk about insurance, don't forget, as Lisa mentioned earlier, there's general liability insurance. Um, that's the backbone of any insurance that might kick in if someone slipped and fell at the meeting. Event cancellation insurance is, is essentially business interruption insurance. It's a different, it's a different animal. And then just last on the part about the third parties, you know, there are errors and omissions policies, and that might be something for a third party to consider. Errors and omissions are essentially akin to malpractice. Uh, and it may be something that might benefit a, a, a third party. Uh, so that might be something that's to review. But Lisa, you know, I know that when it comes to insurance, there's there's really never a general rule. And that's probably the, another point that that you often make as well. Yeah, there, there are, you know, uh, there's a whole group of attorneys that do nothing but litigate over what insurance coverage is or is not under a given policy. Um, insurance is extremely complicated. Mm -hmm. And so to say, oh, you should have X, Y, and Z is not only would it be legal advice we're not going to give you, but it's so fact specific to what the nature of your business is and what you do that you you should be sitting down with a qualified insurance broker and saying here's our business here's what we do here's the risks and make sure that that broker is advising you on the right kind of coverages that you should have um, and also advising you what your policies do and don't do not cover um, certainly oftentimes we'll get a customer that uh, say somebody's having a wedding and they say well i don't want to have an event insurance and you can go on google and type event insurance and find a a million different opportunities to buy policies. That's one thing for a little tiny event, but if you're a business like a third party that is handling lots of, of events, you should be working with somebody who is a professional in this area to help you get the insurance coverage that you need. Perfect, great. Last question. And this is kind of a piggyback off of a few questions earlier. Can negotiation be done via email? and be considered binding or part of the contract? Either no, one of you want to take this? <laughs> if, it, if it's not in the four corners, as they say in the law, if it's not in the written contract, it's not there. So you cannot amend a contract by email. You cannot, I mean, you can certainly negotiate and go back and forth and discuss it, but ultimately you need to make sure that those clauses get into the contract itself. Anything that you discuss leading up to it, doesn't count unless it makes it into the contract. Barbara? You're on mute, Barbara. I was so close. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the golden retriever was tuning in the background, so I, I, I spared you all the, the dog barking. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't agree more, Lisa. Again, everything, no matter how you negotiate, it should all end up at the four corners of the contract. Having said that, a lot of you might rely on email communications, for example, as uh, an acknowledgement by the hotel that there will be no cancellation fees charged. While that might be okay of something to point to, um, certainly I would always favor writing it up, writing up an amendment, writing up an agreement, something along those lines that the parties can sign. They can certainly sign them in a digital environment that's acceptable in, in all the aspects of our industry. So it's something to consider. But yeah, if it's in there, you know, you know, I always make the point, it's not legally binding unless it's in the contract. However, it from a customer standpoint, sure. You know, you could beat your chest and say, I'm a customer, I'm wrong. You know, I was promised this. Of course, the hotels will listen. That's, that's the point, but don't leave yourself exposed. And, you know, as we come to close, a lot of you are saying, Gosh, when you bring a contract, say, oh, I didn't negotiate that. That was my predecessor, right? <laughs> so don't, don't judge me. Again, you know, no one's judging in any of these circumstances because needless to say, we're living in unprecedented circumstance. So uh, it's just important not to put your organization at risk by relying on things that ultimately might not be not come to pass or be enforceable. Yeah, and, and I would just add to that that um, 
you know, I always say, consider that the people who negotiated this contract are no longer going to be there when it's time to perform. I'm going to win the lottery and quit my job and the other person is going to move to another position or whatever it is. So you want it all to be in that written contract so that there's no question about what the parties agreed to. Well, great. Thank you, Barbara and Lisa. And thank you all to everyone who attended today's webinar. Hopskip will be distributing the webinar link to all registrants early next week. And as mentioned, Hopskip is offering today's attendees free pro access to the platform for your first RFP. And we would love the opportunity to show you Hopskip and hear any feedback you might have on today's session. So please feel free to contact us at info at myhopskip.com. Thank you all and have a wonderful weekend. Thanks everybody. Thank you, stay well. Bye now. Bye.